Good evening. Tonight begins, we're going in to the Parshas this week, the two Parshas, it's Behar and Bechukosai. And at the end of the reading, we stand up in unison and wish everyone, one calls out to the other, and then it all comes back to the person himself, Chazak, Chazak, Venis Chazek. By Mincha Shabbos, we began Parsha's Bamidbor, which ushers in the fourth Chumash, Bamidbor, and we begin reading that throughout the summer up until Tish above when we begin Sefer Devorah. Now, the Pasik, the Rokeach, the Rokeach who was a Rishon, says that from the beginning of Bechukosai to Vaolech Eschem Komemios, every letter of the Aleph base is there except for the Samach. To tell you that although the Parsha begins that if you keep the Torah, it's going to be great, and Venusati Sholom Baoretz, and there's going to be tranquility and all these good things. But then the Parsha continues with the Tokacha, that if Chas Shalom, Kal Yisrael is not in the mode of making HaKadosh Baruch Hu happy, there's going to be lots of trouble. But Birchas Koyanim, says the Rokeach, will always exist in the best and in the worst of times and be able to uplift and uh, encourage Klal Yisrael with total positivity. In other words, there's a shield for Birchas Koanim. And he says that's the reason that there is no Samach, a letter Samach, in the beginning of the Sedra, up to Vaolech Eschem Komemius, because there are 60, the Samach is Begematria 60, that there are, there are 60 letters in Birchas Kohen. If you add up from Yivarecha Cho Hashem V'Yishmerecha, Yo'er Hashem Pana Ve'lecha V'chunecha, and Yisa Hashem Pana Ve'lecha V'yosem Lecha Shalom. And, and he explains that that is an eternal protection, a shield of protection for Klal Yisrael. And it, that for gives you a little of insight to why Rabbi Yehuda HaChosid, who lived 950 years ago and he was friends with the Balei Toysis, the grandsons of Rashi, um, that he was the one that said that we do not Duchen, we do not have Birchas Koranim in Chutz uh, And he explained because it was so powerful, the dose of Shefa and Barucha that comes to Klal Yisrael, that in Chutz they could not contain it. That it would like break the pitcher from pouring it in and it was overflowing. There was so much Barucha and so powerful that he answered and said, so they, he, and, and later Doris explained that he allowed it on Yom Tif so that Klaiso wouldn't forget. And they didn't do it for um, Shachris and Musaf, just Musaf on Yom Tif, because by Shachris people are still worried about their Parnosa and they can't do it with complete Simcha. And it requires be ahava fullest strength, simcha, and love for each and every yid. But we see it so powerful. The Svardim were never makabel this Indian of Rav, Rav Yehuda Chosin. If you go into a shul that's Svardik, you'll see that they do duchen every day. 
but the rove of Klal Yisrael, Chassidim and Nisnagim, Litvisha, they do not dochen any other day than Yom Tiv, not Shabbos Cholomoy, Yom Tiv, and if a Yom Tiv falls out on Shabbos, they don't say the Rabbanu Shaloylams in between the paragraphs, in between the Psukim, uh, and uh, any uh, Yud Gimel Midas Arachamim, because Shabbos is the protective shield. It's like we don't blow shoifer on Rosh Hashanah that falls out on Shabbos. Now, if you read the swarm of what happens with the Takiya shoifer, it's so dynamic and so powerful. How could we deny Klai Yisrael? The Chacham said, no, we're afraid somebody may carry the shoifer. So you're going to go wipe out the whole Takiya shoifer? The answer is yes. The Chacham had the power. But at the same time, they knew that Shabbos can be a fill-in for the Takiya Shoifer. So we're not left with an empty void because of no Takiya Shoifer, but we get it from the Koyach of Shabbos, and that's the same case with Lul of Anesrig. If the first day or second day of Sukkot, well, first day can't be, on, uh, second day can't be, but the first day could come out Shabbos. And we don't touch the lul of an esri. Then there's a shefer rub that comes then too. So we get it from the koyach of Shabbos. Now once I am mentioning the, the ballet toistress um, and Rashi, and the riff were from the Rabbeinu Gershon was the first Risha. But 30 years later, Rashi was born in the riff. And in the English year, 1103, 1105, Rashi and the riff were Nifter. So that puts a perspective. And the Rambam and the Ramban was 12 something. The Rambam around 70 years before the Ramban. Some say that the Ramban even saw, at the end of his life, saw the Ramban. <clears throat> Some disagree, but it was that to Kufa. So once I mention that, I want to say to you, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> that there is a, a story, I mean, it's not just a story, there was Rabbeinu Tam, who Toysus mentions on every single page of the Gemara. Now, they came to Rabbeinu Tam, who was one of the greatest of his generations, and they said to him that there's a problem, that there is the widespread minog, that when a boy and girl get engaged, that the girl's family gave some sort of dowry to the chosen so that he continue his learning or he continue to just get his new phase of life now that he's married, have money to be able to exist and whatever. So they gave dowry. And they came to the Rabbeinu Tam and they said to him that we have a catastrophe because there were a lot of young people that died. They had no medicine, no immunization, or I don't mean those crazy shots with the COVID and that nonsense, but I mean regular medicine that's very healthy for people. It's part of Shmartim is not Shosechan. And if a girl's family gave a chosen dowry, and then lo aleinu lo aleichem, the Kala died either right before the Chasna or right after, within the first year, year and a half. The Chasanim did not return the money. They felt they got married, and it wasn't their fault that, that a wife passed away, and they didn't return the money, and it was a catastrophe because the people, most of them, were very poverty-stricken, and they had all their children, 
So they had to collect for six or eight years for this oldest daughter to get married. And now never she died. And if the chosen kept the money, they had to, they didn't know what to do for the next child. Um, if the daughter hadn't died, then they, I guess they were happy, and they were happy to go around collecting and doing whatever, but it was like devastation. So the Rabbeinu Tam made a gzeira that anybody, and his name was Rabbeinu Yaakov, his name was not Rabbeinu Tam, it was Rabbeinu Yaakov. And he made a gezer that anyone who took dowry, and if Minashemayim Nebuch, there was some problem, whether it was death or there was a sickness or whatever happened, that the marriage did not continue, that they had to give back the money. And he attached to his gezer that a curse that if someone didn't return the money and wanted to use it for something, they will never have or see a simen bracha from that money. And it saved men, they, were, they write that it saved, you know, there were hundreds of families that had tragedies throughout uh, Europe and throughout Russia. And, uh, and his psak and gezerah helped and saved many situations. And he added three words to that gezerah from our sedra, from the bechukosai, from the tochacha. And the full strength, most important tochach of the two in the Chamisha Chum Torah, one is here and one is in uh, Sefer Devar and Parshas Kisavo, this is the main tochach. And there is a Pasuk, Visam Lorik Kochachem, and you will put forth your efforts for success and it will go for nothing. It will wither away in the air. Now the word visam is Rabbeinu Tam. Tam, it's the same letters, Tam. So he added to his gezera that Pusik, visa, and a person who doesn't heed my gezera visam lo rik koichachem that all of your efforts and your toil and your sweat to avoid adherence to this gezerah, it's going to be absolute zero. You are not going to get anywhere with the money. You're going to lose the money. You're going to be devastated by the money. There's going to be a curse on that money. So the world was so appreciative that he made this gzeira, they called him Rabbeinu Tam. And it's in the words Visam Lorik Kochachem of our Sedra of the Tokacha today. Now, once I mention in general the Tokacha, I want to say to you that the Baal Shem Tev was the Baal Koire in his shul. And when today in most shuls, either the Baal Koire himself takes the Toichacha, because it's curses. People don't want to have an aliyah and it's read into them the Toichacha. So that people don't want to take it. So either the Baal Koire takes the aliyah or the Baal Koire reads it with no aliyah. But no Lee, he just the person concludes and says the bracha Rena Sheer Nosan Lonu Torah Semes, and he just begins reading the Tokacho with no one being oil. It's different minhogim in different shuls. So the Balshemtiv used to read. Now if you look at the Sefer Siach Eliezer, the Skolya Rebbe's great 
great-grandfather wrote a sefer, and the whole sefer is just on the tochacha. And he shows you pasik by pasik that what looks like to be a curse is really a bracha. The source and hidden in the secrets of the pasik, it is a bracha. So they used to pick the sickest person in the shul to come up for the tochacha to be lain by the Baal Shem Tev, and he read it into the person who was oiled. And that person finished the tochacha completely healed. He walked off the bima like Minashamayim, they gave him new koiches and new strength and new everything. So the Torah, of course, has in it tremendous ability because like Gevura, Gevura is severe, it's din, that's what Gevura is, chesed, is ostensibly, looks like pure chesed, but it says Gevurus Kishaman because the shoyrus of all that chesed comes from Gevura, which when Mashiach will see, will come, we will see how that works, that severity could be pure good. So we have to wait a little to see it, but we would be able to realize it and see how it comes to fruition. Now, somebody once came to the Chofetz Chaim, and the Chofetz Chaim was, greeted this guest, he received him, and the guest was a big gavir, and he looked around the Chavetz Chaim's room and he said, Rebbe, like every chair was broken. There was no, it was like a, it, it didn't look like a dining room. It looked like a room that just some old table and a few chairs broken. So he asked him, he asked the Chavetz Chaim, where is your furniture? So the Chavetz Chaim asked him, where is your furniture? So he said, Rebbe, I'm just on a trip. I left my furniture in the house. So the Chavetz Chaim said, well, I am on just a trip also. Meaning that his main dwelling place will be after his Petira and Shemayim, and that this is all just temporary. And with that, the Chavetz Chaim wanted to explain that what looks like the severity of the Tochacha, and it's some severe statements in the Tochacha about how people will die and bury their children, and ah, terrible, terrible lo alenu lo alechem things. He wanted to stress the point that everything is transient, and that the puzzle has to be complete, and then Mashiach can come. And that completion of what has to happen in Olam Hazeh sometimes includes things along the way that look very bad. But in essence, it's bringing us a step closer to redemption and to fruition of the Geula Shalema. Now, there's a Pasuk in our Sedra, Lo Yirda Lo Beforech, that it's talking about the slaves. Most of our Sedra really is Yoivel and Shmita. Then it has a long discussion about our slaves, that we have to let our slaves go. And while they are slaves, the Pasuk says, Lo Yirda Lo Beforech, you should not overwork him. Don't feel, oh, this is my slave. I can work him to death. Yeah, it's mine. I own him. You're not. There's an iser diarisa. So mafarshim are very quick to point out 
that from this person, from this Pasuk, we can learn Hanhaga in life. You know, there are many people, <coughs> excuse me, there are many people who have a role model father and a role model, model mother. They wake up, they watch Negovasa, they run to a minion, they run to learn, they run to do chesed. They, their days are a reflection of their upbringing. But when they get married, there are challenges that they never had before. And let's say you see it often by, let's say, especially someone becomes a lawyer because they can come into a firm, they're hired, they're talented, they're smart, and they have a job nine to six or nine to five, and they're paid a salary. But once they get into the firm, they want badly to live up and to go up the ladder and become a partner in the firm that doesn't happen with being there from nine to five. That happens by staying till 10 at night, overworking, showing their ability to do stuff that would take someone else a week and they'll do it in two days so that there'll be more promotion, more money, more and suddenly the 25 years of training in his father and mother's house, he barely makes it to a minion, he barely makes it to a Gemara. <coughs> and the Mephorshim say that that is the remise to the average person in his life, this Pusik. Do not overwork your slave because you can become enslaved to your endless work in your desire to get to certain levels and certain positions, and you can become blindsided. And then the years start fleeting away, and you're much further than you, where you were when you were 18 or 19, before you got married, before you became the lawyer. So that is a remis for a person to always stop and take stock. How much am I doing? How is my avoid this Hashem? And is it so important to become the partner? What's wrong with just the hundred or hundred and fifty thousand dollars salary? And then maybe it's not three hundred, but it's enough for you, for your tuitions you have to pay, for your food, for your livelihood, to buy your wife a dress a few times a year. What in basic needs of life? and not to give up the important things or infringe on them. Now, at the end of the Tochacha, towards the very tail end, it says, the afes berisi yaakov vagam af berisi yitzchok ezgor vaho vagam es berisi avram ezgor vaho oritz ezgor so all the mafarshim say that usually when we find in the Torah a remez to the ovos we start with avram we go in the order avram yitzchok and yaakov shimon esrei that's how we do it and over here the pasuk first mentions Yaakov, and then it goes to Yitzchak, and then it goes to Avram. So what they basically say is that Yaakov Avinu is the Amud, the pillar of Torah. And it says, V'yaakov Ishtam, Yoshev Oholim. And Yaakov Avinu represented that level. And we know that 200 years ago and 400 years ago, they learned with such fervor and zest that there was hardly a minute of batola. But as the generations trickled down, could we say that the hasmada of even a great masmid is equal to the hasmada of the Vilna Gom, who was able to count before Rosh Hashanah the minutes 
that he felt he lost in the year. And did tshuva on them, uh, four minutes here, two minutes there in the whole year. We don't have that level of asmada. We have plenty of masmidim, Baruch Hashem. But that level to count the minutes for the year, very hard. So we move after we talk about the Schus Torah and Yaakov Avinu, we move then from there to Yitzchak Avinu, who was the Amud Avoida. That the Avoida, that we did all of the Avoida, and our davening corresponds to Yitzchak Avinu, and the Gemara said that they used to take them three hours each davening, an hour preparation, an hour to come down from the Olam Atzilus, and the actual davening, and that was three times a day, so they spent nine hours a day on davening. Now, who has that level of davening today? The people, unfortunately, some, not everyone, they're busy looking for the quickest minion. Once it's already past 20 minutes, they're getting the gibbers. They are, they, they're impatient. They're angry at the baltfila that took two extra minutes. And then they walk out of the shul and someone wants to tell them a story of Lashonor and they've got 15 minutes to stand there and listen to it because it's so juicy and it's so interesting and it's the gossip of the day, you know. But for the Shemon Esa, they were ready to tell off and embarrass the Baltfila because of his extra few minutes that they thought that he was not quick enough. You know, the Shulchan Aruch says, what is the heter to correct a Baal Koyri? Because a, a man's leaning and he makes a mistake and then 50 people shout out, the right word. The guy is being attacked. So what's the answer? You're being Mavayish Barabim the Baal Koira. So they answer and say, because the Baal Koira goes up to be Moitzi the Tzibur with the Kriya. And he wants to be corrected because if he says something incorrect, maybe it's costing the price of being Moitzi the Rabbim with the Kriya. So he wants to, so it's not that he's embarrassed. He's not happy about it, but he wants to be corrected. And that is our header to correct a Balkoira publicly in front of everyone. Some shuls have the meaning that only the Gabbai standing right there can call out, not everyone, only the one person. But in most shuls, it's not like that, that if a Balkoira makes a real mistake, you'll hear most of the shul call out with the correct reading. So we want to be yoitze. So if someone's davening with a little bit more hislavus or a little bit more regish, a little bit more gefil, and there's another five minutes to the davening, so what? That at least they could hear the brachos and answer amen. As the Arizal says that the quiet Shemana Esrei is the bakosha, the request, for Rifa'enu, for all of these things. But the answer to the Bakoshas is from the loud Shema, I said that we answer Amen. And you have to hear every word and then answer Amen. Some people daven for the Amen, that they're already in the middle, before the people can answer Amen, they're in the middle of the next bracha. They're not supposed to start that next bracha until the receiver answers Amen which means three seconds to eight seconds, but nothing to get nervous about. And then if it doesn't work the Torah of Yaakov and the avoid of the davening of Yitzchak, so then we come at the end, at the end of a tocha, we say, I will remember Yaakov and see if there's enough schus Torah. And if there's not, I'll look to Yitzchak, how's the Avoida? And if not there, then I'll go to Avram Avinu, who's the Amur HaChesed. And it's all formed throughout the generations, and especially our door say that it would never be a time before Mashiach that you couldn't put up front the Schus HaChesed, because Kual Yisrael is busy doing tremendous Chesed for other Yidden, 
So that's why Avram is last, listed last at the end of the Tochacha, because if nothing else works, we pull out the ace in our pocket and we talk about Avram Avinu via Chesed that could always win the day for us. And that's why he is mentioned here in the Tochacha last. Now, the Pasuk says, Ufanisi Aleichem, that when you'll do good, Ufanisi Aleichem, and I will turn to you. Rashi says on those words, Ufanisi Aleichem, that Ethne Kol Asokai, that I, I will turn and push away all my involvement and come to you, Ufanisi Alech, and I'll come to you and give you bracha and give you everything that you, that you need. So, the point the Mephorshim says is, what do you mean, HaKadosh Baruch Hu? When we, human beings, are busy at our desks and we're busy with what we're working on, and we have a pile waiting for us, and everything else. The but Hakadosh Baruch Hu doesn't have to turn from this. Like if I I'll have to stop this and turn to you and give you good and give you what you need. Hakadosh Baruch Hu could do everything at the same time. So the Mefarshim say the Pusik wants to tell us something else. And that's what Rashi means, that I will turn from my asokim. The world events will change their course and change their driven paths that they're doing and suddenly change for your benefit. And they gave, one of them, unfortunately, gave an example that there was somebody who had moved to a village or a little town and he opened a store. And there was a neighboring country nearby. In other words, he was almost in, that town was in the border between his country and the next country. And a little war broke out, and they desperately needed the items that this person opened up his store in this town. And he became fat from this war, he became fabulously wealthy. And they say that's what it means. That war broke out because he now came to that town and that he opened that store. That would be the crucial thing that they desperately needed. There was an item in that store. I think it was the wood that they needed. There was something of coal for the heat to keep them warm. But it was that store that thrust him into the realm of wealth because of the war. So he would look at it that there was a war and because of it, he became rich. And the Pasuk is telling us, Ufanisi Aleichem, that I'll cause the war because you moved into that town and I, that was my way of making you rich. So we have to know that events that happen don't just happen. They happen and that there's a Cheshben, a Kodesh Baruch Hu. You know, sometimes people think, how could a Kodesh Baruch Hu do this or that? It was a baby, it was this. How could he do it? We are not more Rachmanin than HaKadosh Baruch Hu. He has a greater love for every Yid, and he has more Rachmanis with Chesed and Rachman than any Yid could have for someone else. But we don't know the Cheshman. We're not behind the curtain to see why this has to happen or why that has to happen. So that's Ufanisi Aleichem, world events take their path and occurrence, like it says in the Pasuk in Hazinu, that Yisov Avenu Yevon Isha, 
Kinesha Yari Kino goes to love your Achei Yefros Kenaf of Yikachei Yisrael of Russo. Know that the pasuk before, but it means that world events shape themselves around Klal Yisrael. It's not that things happen between world powers. Nothing to do with the Yidden. Everything to do with the Yidden. As it says in that Pusik that I'm trying to remember uh, in Hazinu. Now... The Pasuk says as Kaspecho lo Siten lo Beneshech. You're not allowed to lend a yid money with interest. Now, yes, many do. They have a heter iska, which means it's not a loan, it's an investment in what the money's going for, and that which you're paying him a profit. Interest is not interest, it's iska. It's because he invested in a business. And he's getting back a thousand dollars a month from it because of his investment. Many people don't like the smell of a hetter, even though it's a complete hetter, and it's al pishul chenarach. I don't want to cast any negative image or any statement against someone who lends for interest. But interest can be a very, very severe thing. It even says that the one who lends with interest is over an Isser Diaraisa, and the one who borrows is also paying the interest over an Isser Diaraisa. And it says Izevel, that wicked queen, that they dragged her bones in the public after she died because of all the interest that she took. That was why they dragged her bones. The Mephorshim said, the Gemara says it, that that was her punishment, the zilzo and the bizoyim because of the interest. But it says in the Pasuk, our Sedra, that your money you should not lend for interest. And the end of that Pasuk, it says that about Yetzias Mitzrayim, because you were taken out of Mitzrayim, Ani Hashem Elokeichem. So the Mephorshim are curious, what does Yetzias Mitzrayim have to do with lending money or borrowing money with interest involved? So the Pasuk says, the two, the Mephorshim, Rashi brings also, um, the reason is because in Yetzias Mitzrayim, that like HaKadosh Baruch Hu knew by the Makas Bechorus in Mitzrayim, Rashi says, that you couldn't hide. That means when Hashem wanted to kill the firstborn, if they went in a closet and thought they would be able to hide, they didn't. Hashem knew exactly where they were and every firstborn died except for Paro. He was still alive in Ninveh with the story of Yonah and the whale. He was the king of Ninveh, and that's where Yonah ended up. But everyone else died. So the Pasuk is telling us, don't lend with interest because I am a Kodesh Baruch Hu, and I knew who every Bechor was in Mitzrayim, and they all died. So if you lend with interest and you're giving out rationale, well, I think the guy is not Jewish, he may be a relative, he's from a relative, you're trying to build a rationale of why you lent the interest. Just like I knew who every Bechor was, I know exactly what you're doing, and there's no getting away from me. So don't lend for, with the interest. And the Torah really says, the same thing by Mosnei Tzedek, Avnei Tzedek, that the weight system, that somebody used to take a scale and put a certain amount of food or vegetables on it, and according to the weight, so it says that many used to load up the side with salt. 
so that it was, they only got like 60% of what they were actually buying. They charged them for the weight. So the weight was this and this per pound, and they charged them. The only one who would know what's going on is HaKadosh Baruch Hu. That that cheating was right in front of HaKadosh Baruch Hu. And um, we really have to just know that there's no hiding. That if we want to make sure we never miss a Zman Krishna, we have to take it very seriously. You know, somebody could be very tired, but if he has to catch the plane at 12, 12 noon to go to Eretz Yisrael, he's not turning over and saying, well, I could sleep another half an hour and takes a risk at getting late, getting to the airport late and missing the plane. But he has to be vigilant because there is a caretaker and there is a cheshben, an account tint, a Kurdish Baruch Hu, who's putting everything down and the good likewise is also put down. And that's what the person should be busy doing. Now the Pasik says, The Pasik says, Ba'achaltem lachmechem l'sova. And Rashi says, Oicho bekima and umisborech meimov. That means a person, there are two types of people. There's a person, you see, about Shemitah, if the question is asked by the, the Pesach says that if somebody asks, Manocha, what are we eating in the seventh year? The seventh year, it's being completely wiped out. In other words, we're not allowed to touch the field. We can't have any benefit. We can't do this. We can't do that. So what are we going to eat? Vitsi visi es birchasi. The Akkadish Baruch Hu answers, the Pasuk says, and says, I will give you my bracha. So the Sipurna says that it sounds from this Pasuk like it means that if you ask, what are we going to eat? Then you get the bracha. But then if you don't ask, what happens? then, which means you have the pure amuna, then you won't even ask, where will I have food to eat? He will feel that no matter what he eats, he's full. He's full. The person who asks has to be reassured there's a bracha and he has to see it come. But the person who has the amuna that I could have broke in a year of Shemitah, would never leave Klal Yisrael without the necessary food, and you have to just be Mekayim the Mitzvah with full emuna. ends up eating only a little bit, because he doesn't have more, but the bracha comes into him because he didn't ask, and he gets the full bracha b'meya in his stomach, in his body, as if he ate a full big meal, and that gives him the nourishment. And Reb Meir Simcha, uh, Reb Meir Simcha said that by Moshe Rabbeinu, when he hit the rock, before he hit the rock, the Pasuk says, before he hit the rock. You're going to have plenty to drink, the people and their cattle. But after he hit the rock, it says, The word S is eliminated. It just says there's now water for the people and there's enough water for the cattle, but it doesn't say the S be 
And that's the difference that before they hit the rock, it was in a Bechina in the realm of total Emuna that it was going to hap, happen. But after he hit the rock, then it, the people and the animals were not at the same level of Chutz L'derech HaTeva, Nes, Golui, that it was the people and the, the animals were a lesser, and each one at their own level would have gotten. But once they hit the rock, it was all the same, the people and the cattle. They got the water. But it wasn't some special level that the people were at, that there was a difference them to the cattle. Like when it was the statement before he hit the rock. Even though the Rambam, as I mentioned to you many weeks ago, holds that the Avera of, Mo, of Moshe Rabbeinu was not hitting the rock. It was because he said, Shimon, Shimon Noha Moirim. Listen to me, you rebellious Yidden, you people who are rebellious. And a leader can never lose patience with his flock. And that's why he was told he cannot go into Eretz Yisrael. And his Talmidim brought a riot that that was not. The Rambam's uh, statement that the Avera was not hitting the rock, it was talking to the Jewish people that way, because on Shemini Yatzeres, when we ask for water on the stanza of Moshe Rabbeinu, we mentioned that he hit the rock. Now, if we're supplicating, we're asking for water. Why would we mention something that Hashem was angry about or that he did in Avera? And we mention, Vayachas Aselo, Vayetsu Mayim. So why would we even mention that? So they say that that's the proof that... He did not do that as any type of an Avera. What? And I want to close tonight's shir with a statement that, you know, tonight we begin the week of Yesod. And we know that Reb Shlomkesville, who Zecher Tzadik V'Kodesh L'Vrocha Zechus HaYogein Aleinu Rev Shlomka lived in Zvil and then he moved to Eretz Yisrael and lived there around 15 years till he was Nifter in 1945 and Rev Shlomka uh, he lived his whole life L'Malam and Ateva he used to walk in the street with Chassidim and stop and if he saw a bird one time he stopped and he said, you see that bird? It's a neshama in there for 17 years has not gone into Gan Eden yet because it forgot a varein of fashos. So it's waiting for its ticking. So he told one of the people to take an apple, make the bracha. They all answered, Amen. And then they made a varein of fashos and answered, Amen. He said, now that bird had its ticking, the neshama is going into Gan Eden. And his yard said is on Yesod Shebi Yesod, which is like the biggest level of Kedusha that you could have in Olam Hazah. And it was very appropriate, appropriate and fitting that he was Nifter on Yesod Shebi Yesod. Um, everything he did was above and beyond, like the story when he was still in Zvil, there was a tailor who had an apprentice, a goy, working by him to learn the trade. And he asked the owner if he could put a cot in his store in the corner so he shouldn't have, he lived in his parents' house, which was the other side of town, that he wouldn't have to go so for such a long journey every day back and forth. So the owner said, no problem. One Sunday morning, he came in and he thought he would find the boy, the apprentice, sleeping still, and he found him on the floor dead. Now, in those days, if they found in the Jewish quarter a goy, a child dead, a young man, they blamed immediately the Jews, and there was havoc. They would wreak havoc with the Jews. 
So this tailor realized that this is serious, so he ran to the other side of town, to Rav Shlomkovsville, and Rav Shlomkov told him to take a spoon, because it was a Sunday morning, and there was, the chum pot was still on the stove. And he told him to take a spoon, excuse me, a spoon filled, a spoon filled with chum, go back to his shop and put it into the young man's mouth, the dead young man on the floor, put it into his mouth. As soon as he did that, he opened his eyes and he said, where am I? What, what am I doing on the floor? Uh, so he said, well, you fell asleep on the floor. So the, the young man asked, you know, I'm still so tired. This cot is not as comfortable as my own bed. So I'd like to go home for the day. So he said, yes. By all means, he went home, got into bed, and died. So he wasn't found dead in the Jewish quarter. He was in his parents' house. That was the koyach of Rav Shlomka of Zvil. Zechuso Yoge Naleinu, who was nifter 77 years ago, on Yesod Shebe Yesod. Have a wonderful week. His chush should always be Megan for us. He took care of Yidin unbelievably so. And we should be able to get ready for next Shabbos. This coming Shabbos is not Shabbos Mavorachim. But next Shabbos is Shabbos Mavorachim. And I think Sunday, right away, Motsoi Shabbos is Rosh Chodesh Sivan. And with the beautiful Yom Tov of Shavuos upcoming, Habo Oleinu Letoifer.